I've been studying the disc golf backhand form for two years, and recently I started using simple 3D simulations to understand the mechanics better. However, setting every motion manually is boring and very limited to my knowledge. So I had an idea of making a genetic algorithm that could train itself and that way find the most efficient backhand form, much quicker than I could do it and also without being limited to my understanding of the form. The only slight problem with that is that I'm a terrible programmer, but for some reason I decided to try anyway. <laughs> and after over a month of struggling with the code, I finally got nice looking results. But before we take a look at those, let's go through how I got there to better understand what we're going to be looking at. I had no idea how to approach the genetic thing, but I knew I could start out just by algorithmically building the thrower, you know, the mechanics. And this was the easy part, but even that took me quite a while to figure out. And by the way, this thrower is just a simple mechanical representation of a human with a torso, left shoulder, right shoulder, upper arm, forearm, hand, and it sort of represents a human like this. So you're going to be seeing a lot of these mechanical throwers, so you can just <laughs> visualize the human there. So yeah, eventually I got the thrower building code working and now I had a thrower. It just doesn't do anything. Yet. So after a bit of fiddling around I got it doing something. Yeah, it was gonna be a long road. <laughs> So yeah, I started thinking about how to approach the actual throwing part. I needed to have a simple set of instructions that the thrower can take and reliably execute a certain throw with. And in Unity, which is what I made the simulator with, I have these joints between the objects, like hinges, and I can set the target angular velocity for every joint. And the joints will then use a given amount of torque to try to match that target angular velocity. Until I set a new one, I can change the target velocity anytime I want to. So I decided to have the instructions be just a list of target angular velocities for every joint. And then I would set the target velocity to the next element on the list every x seconds. So it would be like a timeline of values with a certain temporal resolution. And each row of values is basically a single gene in genetic algorithm terms. Okay, okay, that was a long and boring explanation, but it's kind of the core of the entire simulator, so I felt like it's important to understand the basics. But anyway, I eventually got to a point where I had the thrower actually following values, so I spent a little time trying to manually write some values that would make a good looking throw. And yeah, I kind of quickly decided to move on to trying to figure out how to make the computer do that part. So my first idea was to just brute force all the possible combinations, so I wouldn't have to do any algorithmic improvement. So I tried to simplify the instructions, I went for a pretty low temporal resolution, and did a couple other things, but it turns out that even with my simplest possible uh, instructions, that are still somewhat feasible, it still amounts to about this many possible combinations. So yeah, it was gonna take a little too long to compute all of those, so I had to figure out something else. I was still dreading the genetic algorithm though, so first I tried a simpler approach that would just take an existing manually made throw and add some small random mutations here and there. And based on the performance of these mutations it would update the base values and keep repeating the cycle. And that way eventually finding better and better throws. But that of course very quickly runs into local maximums, which the genetic algorithms are much better at avoiding. So I had to give up on that and just get going with the genetic algorithm. Luckily I have a brother who's a professional programmer and he came to visit me to give me some pointers, which I was really happy about. And after looking at what I had written so far, he wrote me some pseudocode. Okay, it wasn't that bad, calm down. I just thought it'd be a funny joke. And now I started rambling about it, so it's not even funny anymore. But yeah, he wrote me some pseudocode for the general structure of the genetic algorithm. So I still had to do the actual programming, which was a nice learning experience. But I had his general directions to follow, which made the process much quicker than it would have otherwise been. Thanks, brother. I say much quicker, and what I mean by that is that it still took an absolute eternity for my dumb brain to get it right. I ran into every possible problem, and I probably made every possible mistake while trying to get it to work. Okay. 
But eventually I did run out of ways to fail and I got to a point where the throwers actually spawned in the right places and seemed to be inheriting the genes in the correct manner. So now it was just a case of fine-tuning all the parameters and the mutation functions and the mechanics of the thrower and everything so that we wouldn't run into those pesky local maximums. And that turned out to be another huge challenge. I spent so much time looking at the countless generations of throwers. In the beginning it converged into some pretty interesting looking throws, so I knew that I was pretty far away from the actual ideal form. It turns out that it's actually really difficult to get everything right with a genetic algorithm. It's not like a magic machine where you hand it a mechanical system and it always, without fail, converges into the best throw. All the variables and functions play into each other. If you change one thing, it can break another. The types and amounts of mutation really matter, as do the population sizes and the mechanics and etc. etc. I spent a good couple weeks on this problem. I did eventually find some light at the end of the tunnel, and here are some of the highlight changes that led me towards the solution. I changed from only mutating single values in the genes to also adding wider bumps and valleys. I changed from updating the target velocity values every tenth of a second to updating them every frame, which adds a lot more temporal resolution to the throw. I changed from letting the disc break itself off of the hand with a force threshold to keeping the disc firmly attached for a certain number of frames. I was trying to mimic a real throw where the disc sort of naturally just leaves the hand without a conscious release. But in the simulation environment it was just so much more consistent to have the release be timed. So I went with that. I could only run 500 throwers at a time because of performance limits, which made my population a bit small. So I made a system that can run a much bigger population in separate passes, which of course takes a lot more time, but it allows for much more genetic variety. I asked my wife to measure my actual joint lengths to get the model mechanics represent my situation more realistically, and just to have a real human example as the thrower. And I found the best working values for mutation, gene crossing, the mechanics, etc. by lots of trial and error. My biggest problem was that the thrower had a bad tendency to lag too much behind with the upper arm. You know, an amateur mistake, and I was like, why do you not realize that this is not the best way to throw? And I finally realized that the upper arm was just too weak. It just didn't have the strength to follow the throw at a good angle. So that resulted in a lot of fine-tuning of the strengths of each and every joint to better mimic a human. In general it seems that you just need to have the torso be the strongest and then go slightly less strong for each subsequent joint. And that seems to be the best recipe for a good-looking throw. And during all this I had been running a lot of simulations. Overnight, during the day, whenever I had the time, I was always running the simulations. And one morning I woke up, I went to the studio to see if this particular overnight run had finally worked, and it had. I finally had a good looking throw, and I knew that all these weeks of working on this were not wasted after all, like I was worried about. And so I could finally just work a little more on making the visuals a bit better, adding some data visualization like a disk trail and some angular velocity indicators. And then we can go ahead and take a look at the best throw my program has managed to produce so far. Yeah, there it is. Looks a lot like I would have expected it to look. So, yeah, no surprises in the end, but it is very cool to see the basic backhand form sort of independently verified by a genetic algorithm. And there are actually a couple very interesting differences to how good throwers actually throw in real world. And there's also a couple very interesting small details that I actually learned new things from. There's two major things that I think are different from how most good players throw. The most obvious one is that it really seems to like swinging the disc quite far back behind the thrower before swinging it to the front side again, here after the peak of the reachback. I would have thought that it's better to just bring it more straight back like this, and then go from there. But I realized that this could actually be just a side product of the mechanics of the thrower here. You see this torso here is bolted in place, like in concrete. It doesn't move at all, no matter what kind of forces you apply to it. 
so to me it seems that it's just using the bolted on nature of the torso to collect a little extra momentum to the disc before starting to pull it forward. It really throws itself against the rigid torso, and I don't think the energy transfer would really work like that in real life. Also there's this one weird thing with the hand orientation. The simulator really likes to have the hand like this for some reason. And I don't really understand why. You would think that this kind of action would bring some extra power to the throw. But it could be that it just gets some mechanical advantage from having the disc further from the arm. And because it doesn't have to worry about the spin of the disc at all, it just goes with this. But yeah, other than those two things, I think this throw looks surprisingly familiar. The power pocket is there, even though the hand orientation makes it look less similar than it actually is. The roughly 90 degree angle of the upper arm and the torso. The left arm swinging towards the pocket just before the torso starts uncoiling. We'll come back to the left arm in a bit, but it really is amazing that the simulator got all of those things right. Remember, it doesn't know anything about the throw when the simulation starts. It starts with completely random twitching, and it's just given the objective to get the disc out of the hand and moving as fast in this direction as possible. It really feels quite remarkable that it comes up with basically the same thing as we humans have come up with. By the way, I also made this other version of the throw. It's manually adjusted so that it looks more like what I think would be good form. Like we have a straighter reach back, the torso turns a bit more forward before stopping instead of facing completely sideways. The hand orientation looks a bit better and so on. But yeah, the disc just doesn't go as fast for some reason. Let me know what you think is the reason. But anyways, one of the main things I wanted to know when I started this project is what is the optimal angle between the upper arm and the torso? It's always said to be roughly 90 degrees, but I wanted to know if it's exactly 90, a little more than 90, a little less, or what. And it turns out that according to this simulation, after the peak of the reachback to about this point here, the angle is pretty much a perfect 90 degrees, and from here forward it actually starts opening past 90 degrees until the release. This moment here is a bit confusing, because looking at the shoulder the angle looks to be almost exactly 90, but the angle to the center line of the torso is well past 90. And turning the right shoulder past the center line like this in the power pocket is another thing that I'm not sure would translate all that well into the real world, but it's yet another interesting thing to think about. And yeah, the left arm action is really interesting. If you pay close attention to the left arm here, it starts to swing towards the power pocket here, like you'd expect. But at this point it reverses the direction and starts pushing the other way. And that gives the torso some extra torque in this direction. You know, equal and opposite reactions and so on. When I first saw this I was like, wow, that totally makes sense. But I hadn't really thought about it like that before. And this simulator obviously has just one stump here. And in the real world the reverse motion is usually done more like this. But yeah, this simulation actually made me think about the offhand action a bit differently. And it resulted in a more intuitive and powerful swing for my left arm. Another interesting point is that theoretically the transfer of power would be the most efficient if the torso came to a complete stop when the disc is doing the final speed up. And looking at this, it really is quite perfect. Like, look at how this torso looks like it's hitting a wall here. But it's not. The power transfer is just that good. I also got curious about how my throw would compare to the simulator throw. And I knew there'd be a lot of differences and that it wouldn't really be a reasonable comparison. But I still went and filmed my throw from above and made a disc trail for this also. So yeah, here's my throw compared to the simulator. Make of that what you will. I'm not sure how useful any of this is, but it's interesting. And by the way, I also filmed a throw with a run-up, so here's that. That's also a very interesting clip, just on its own. And yeah, that's all the most interesting bits that came to my mind looking at the simulation. There's obviously much more to discuss, and there would be even more to dive into regarding developing the simulator further. You could do so many things. You could add a complete left arm, you could try to get real-world strength values for the joints, you could add the rest of the human, the hips, the legs, etc. I'm not sure if I'll do any of that in the future, but I think I've seen enough thrower generations for a while now. So yeah, I'll take a break from this simulation stuff now, 
because next up is actually another real-world backhand video with many interesting new developments. Okay, that's all you get to see for now, but definitely do stay tuned for the next video. Thank you so much for watching, this was a very interesting journey for me, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I'll see you later.